Okay, when Bert asked me to do this, uh, he just wanted me to do an overall um, uh, summary of just some of the projects that I've worked in. So I'm not going to go into any high detail. Um, my main focus is going to be the structural aspect of graphite deposits. Um, and some of the projects are still confidential, so I can't talk about the resources at the moment. Um, but if any questions at the end or any, any specifics, please ask, ask away. Uh, just before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge um, a few people and companies. Uh, PT Grafindo from Indonesia, Aris Mines, Sri Lanka, uh, the Geological Survey and Mining Bureau of Sri Lanka, the Chairman of the Government uh, uh, Graphite Mine in Sri Lanka, um, New Equatorial Investments, Singapore, ERE Gems, DMCC, this is the project in Tanzania. Uh, thank you to the Australian Institute of Geoscientists for allowing me to present to you today. Thank you for being here and also SRK Consulting. So the outline, I just wanted to look at three, the three main types of graphite, natural graphite, and just give examples of each of the projects that I've worked on. So the first one is the amorphous fine grain, fine flake, sorry, graphite in Kalimantan. Then I'll do a very sort of overview of vein and lump graphite uh, from Sri Lanka. Uh, I don't really have permission to talk about the projects I've worked on, so I'll just discuss uh, my experience when I went down the mine, at the government mine, uh, Kataga uh, Kalonga. Um, and, and finally, just a little bit about some flake graphite project that I'm currently working on in, in, in the Lindi uh, region of Tanzania. And some concluding thoughts. Uh, so the location, uh, Kalimantan, Borneo. So we're basically over here in the western part of uh, Kalimantan. Project's just up here. This is just our track from Pontiana, where you fly in from Jakarta, right on the equator. This was done, I did this project about three and a half years ago, so memory's a little bit fading, I'm afraid, but I'll, I'll try and remember some of the more specific detail. So this was a, what I think is an example of amorphous fine flake graphite project. Uh, the geology is the sort of thin carbonaceous graphitic units intercalated with uh, graphite poor siliciclastic units. There is a strong north-northeast foliation, um, mainly dipping to the west with a, with a northward plunge. To the west, there's, um, there's granite intrusions, which have also added a bit of heat into the, into the system. And there's also been some dolerytic sills, which intrude the main deposit, and also dikes, which affect, um, will, will affect the, the eventual exploitation of this deposit. And there's abundant faulting. There's, there's a lot of faulting and a lot of fault gouge in this particular uh, deposit. And there's a lot of, a lot of uh, evidence, field evidence, for polyphase deformation, at least three uh, deformation events that can be clearly seen in the field. Uh, you've got folds, faulting, as I said, and also um, some wooden structures as well. And finally, there's been a, a late stage cross cutting of quartz and calcite, <laughs> calcite veins through, through the uh, deposit. Uh, this was originally discovered from a resistivity survey done, and this is just uh, the results of inversion modeling. Uh, so basically, the, uh, the drill holes are just uh, testing some of these loads which were identified from resistivity. As you can see, they're, they're quite, quite clear. Some, some are continuous, some are discontinuous. There's a structure running through here, which, which you can pick out from the field. Uh, and, and as I say, the, these, these are the, the drill holes. They were, they were drilled, initially, they were, they were drilling vertical holes um, into very steeply dipping uh, strata. So when we did our first site, site, site visit, we gave them some, some hints and some suggestions about how to change the drilling patterns. And this is just the same um, anomalies superimposed onto the um, geology. The main gray area is basically phyllites. Uh, and there's also some limestone over here, which is not shown in this particular map. Um, and there's also quite a bit of volcanic sequences in here. This is just some of the, um, <coughs> sorry, I've got a bit of a cold. Um, some of the styles of graphitic mineralization, which we observed in the drill core. So you can see up here, we have some banded stratiform type. Uh, and here we have some hosted, shear hosted mineralization. We also have some fault brecciation and, and, and graphitic class embedded in, in, in these uh, breccias and agglomerates. 
And there's also the, this disseminated graphite within these, with, which has been extensively veined with, with calcite. There's also a lot of uh, sulfur in the system, uh, which was observed during our first site visit. Um, this iron, iron staining, you can see, uh, is due to the uh, pyrite. We also have some uh, coarse-grained disseminated graphite in, in, in these phyllites. Again, you've got pyrite, chalk operite mostly. Uh, some coarse-grained disseminated uh, pyrite up here as well in these phyllitic bands. And it's causing a lot of uh, issues with uh, acid drainage, which, which the, um, at the time the, the client wasn't aware of until we pointed this out to them. Uh, the limestone to the west may help um, when it comes to developing this as a mine. This is just an example um, of a normal fault. Sorry, there's no scale bar, but this is about a meter. So you can see the fault plane here. It's a north-south fault. And there's also, um, uh, you, you get some striations as well coming down this plane, which gives you, gives you an indication of um, kinematic fault m movements. Similarly, the, um, the more graphitic rich units have obviously taken up more of the strain and they tend to wrap around these more competent units, giving, the, giving you these building structures in a later extensional event. Um, these, these were the, um, the domains of which, which I modelled. Um, they're not ideal, I know that because I did them. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the client didn't do any... Uh, well, he did some pet petrography work, but he didn't do much in the way of um, flake size. They, did, they didn't, not flake size, sorry, um, metallurgy recovery. They didn't do any of the um, advice that we suggested about looking at these four styles of mineralization and trying to log in them so we can try and domain it on that way. Um, so I ended up having to do basically using a combination of grade and uh, lithology modeling. Um, there is a definite uh, slight clockwise rotation to the north of this major fault running through here, and you also have these igneous intrusions coming through here. The, the, at the time, the drill spacing was probably good enough for maybe an indicated resource, but because there was, an, there was no additional information, the only thing we could do is make most of it classified as inferred and exploration target. So the faults are offset. The, the faults, um, both north-south faults and this, this one here, offset these loads. The uh, fault rotation is obviously affecting the um, direction of greatest continuity, so you need to um, look at your variography and use different variograms depending on which side of the st structure that you happen to be on, modeling. And the, the, uh, the mineralization is basically um, quite, quite, quite uh, structurally um, controlled by brittle ductile shearing. So a um, quick one now to Sri Lanka, looking at a Sri Lankan vein and lump graphite. I've worked on about five different projects here. Uh, initially with Bora Bora Resources on their Kingfisher project, then for um, Aris Mines at the Queen's Mine, uh, and also for um, a client in Singapore who's looking to do an IPO listing. So the uniqueness about Sri Lankan vein is it's the largest known occurrence of crystalline vein graphite um, that we know of. Um, it's hosted in sequences of um, upper amphibolite fasces, metamorphic rocks, uh, including garnet rich, orthopyroxene, bearing quartz of felspathic, and garnet biotite gneisses. Uh, the quartz felspathic, sorry, the quartz felspar pegmatites tend to run parallel to the foliation, uh, and these are interlayered with these garnet rich um, metabasites and quartzites. These quartzites um, introduce some challenges to, to drilling when you're drilling through these very hard, competent rocks and you suddenly hit these graphite veins. And there's very little disseminated graphite within the actual horse rocks themselves. So it's a hydrothermal precipitation event. And the graphitic, uh, uh, total graphitic carbon can range from around 95 to 97% and can be very quickly and easily at cost, you know, at cost beneficiated to 99.9%. A uh, very simplified geology model, uh, sorry, geology map of Sri Lanka. Uh, so you can see there's um, mostly paleoproterozoic, uh, neoproterozoic high grade metamorphic rocks um, with a little bit of um, younger sequences up in the north, some limestones up here, and some Cenozoic deposits, superficial covering up the, the metamorphic basement. As uh, you can see, the, the crust is very old. 
And there's three main complexes. And as you can see from the uh, depiction of this corridor with, uh, where all those old abandoned graphic deposits are known to occur, uh, they, all, they all tend to be within the Highland and the Wani complex only. You don't get any in, in this material here. The majority of the deposits happen to be in the southwest of the country. As I said, they're located within this north-northeast, south-southwest corridor, which may suggest some kind of you know, regional structural event to, to explain their occurrence. They're hosted in the Highland and the Wani complexes. Uh, this is just some, some photos from a site visit that I did to the, to the mine, to the government's mine underground. So just showing you the lift at the bottom of the main shaft here. A typical adit. This is down at 1,130 feet level. Some graphite vein here and some sulfide mineralization. So the scale bar there is up, I think that's about, um, I can't even read that. It's about 15 centimeters, this white bar here. This is just a, a survey point underground for, for mapping and an example of a, of a, um, a graphite vein showing needle fibrous texture perpendicular to the wall rocks. Just another example from, from, the, from the mine underground, just to show that these are, these are zoned with the richest graphite tends to be in the middle, although sometimes you also get a surface forming along the middle, which tends to be quartz, calcite, um, and some sulfides, pyrite mostly. Um, just an example, that if, if you're ever in Colombo, uh, I recommend you go to the, to the GSMB. They have some fantastic specimens um, which you can view. Uh, of, the, of the graphite. Uh, this is just a, a, a map at the 170 meter level. This was published, I think it was in the mid 90s now, but just to give you an idea of the, um, the form of these veins. So you can see up here, this is a five meter scale bar. And the, the majority are, are approximately running east-west. Um, the tent, the tent, in terms of horizontal, they, they tend to peter out quite quickly. Uh, which, which, is, which again is challenging if you're trying to define a resource um, for, for Jork. Uh, your drilling your drill spacing, you need, to be, you need to be cognizant of the, uh, the spacing of your drilling for uh, correlation of these veins. But, but in terms of depth, they go down very deep. And this was just a map uh, just outside the, um, the, main, the main mine entrance, which I happened to see and take a picture of. So you can see the main shaft coming down here. So this is where we, so this is where we were that, in that level that I just showed you. This, was, this is at the, um, the same level here in feet. So that was the previous one was in meters. Most of the veins have been, have been mined out up here. This mine has been going since the 1820s, uh, even though they haven't got any defined reserves or resource for that matter. This is the main, the main structure, the vein town structure, which um, tends to have the veins. You get very numerous veins, thin veins near the surface. And as you come deeper, they, they, um, they tend to disappear and coalesce and form these thicker veins at depth, a bit like a tree structure. The, uh, the grade control and quality assessment is quite rudimentary and labor intensive. Uh, you tend to have um, women, female workforce, basically either using a hammer for sound or biting it. And that's how the grade control, grading, uh, controlling the, uh, the product. <laughs> Uh, and this is actually waste. So even, even if they get the smallest fragment of rock fragment within the graphite, they just throw it away in, into waste, which is obviously a resource in its own right. So this is just um, the topography of the um, government mine, which is just here. And the this is basically following this north-south double plunging antiform. Uh, it seems that most of the deposits tend to be associated with these um, recumbent folds and double plunging uh, domal structures. The, the Queen's Mine is just, is just here, just north of this um, interpretive fault here. And you've also got another mine up here, Ragadara. Again, um, very similar east-west, approximately trending veins um, that tend to, tend to um, at the surface, run about 10 to 15 centimetres but it can get down to like a meter, two meters at depth. But again, the lateral extent isn't great. Um, this is just a VTAM survey, which um, was done by Bora Bora Resources. So again, there's a government mine there, footprint here, um, the Queen's mine here. 
the, 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 the thought is, the model is that the Queen's mine, because it's higher up topographically uh, and the veins are thinner, that if you go deeper down, you may get similar thicknesses to what you see at the government mine here. Of course, that's assuming that this fault isn't dropping to the south. So this is just um, something that I'm just, I'm just trying to think, you know, what's caused this, you know, why, why Sri Lanka, basically? Why do we have all these, you know, east-west veins all the way up and down the north-south spine of the country? So the veins, so it's just some characteristics of the veins that they all kind of share in common. They, they all tend to be sub-parallel and restricted along strike. Uh, they have variable spacing. The thickest parts of the vein are obviously towards the center of, of the vein, where you tend to get the highest grade, but not always. And obviously they thin and disappear at the tips, which could be 30 to 40 meters or even less than that, through two to three meters, depending on the extents. So that they form these like on echelon arrays of um, vein structures. So basically uh, the vertical extent of the, of the veins is obviously greater than the horizontal component and the, and the uh, thickening at depth. Um, but become less frequent. They're associated with these folds and refolded double plunging antiforms. So, and uh, you seem to have this symmetrical development um, for, for like a crack seal precipitation um, from the wall rock. And sometimes you get these needle structures forming perpendicular to the wall rock. Uh, so I was thinking, obviously, you need, a, you need to, get, to get these um, east-west emplaced veins then you, put, you need, a, you need a, an east-west compression or with a north-south extension. They're reactivating these old uh, uh, structural faults, uh, giving you these on echelon uh, vein arrays just here. So this is giving you a dextral shearing event. But again, this is just a, just a, a working model that I've, I've put out on that. I don't know um, if it's correct or not. So just to summarize, so the veins are associated with these double plunging antiforms. Uh, it's a regional structural event of vein emplacement throughout the country. And I think you have this cracked seal vein model of development. And finally, I'll just very briefly talk about uh, Tanzania. Um, this project is currently undergoing, so it's still a bit sensitive, some of the, some of the, um, the data. But the, uh, the client is the ERA GEMS. And they're looking at um, a flake size distribution from sort of uh, medium coarse with some jumbo flake along sh uh, shear, shear zones. They occur in neoproterozoic rocks off the Mozambican belt. These are just some characteristics. Uh, amphibolite fasces metamorphism. The host rocks are, are, are fine-grained schists containing mica and graphite. And again, you have this, this, this um, common theme of polyphase deformation. Um, concordant foliation and layering of graphite is slightly anticlockwise to the actual lithological um, contacts. Uh, the, the, and the, uh, the foliation is dipping around about 36 to the east, but that steepens as you go westward. And also as you go north, the, um, there's two things happening. There's a regional uh, clockwise swing to the north, and that's also accentuated locally by faulting. And the graphite flake, as I say, shows mostly medium to coarse with occasional jumbo. So they occur as disseminated ore and as schist, loads and bands in nice quartzite and impure marble. It's of a, a flaky variety with a carbon content of 1% to 2% in disseminated, and as high as 47.9% in graphitic schist. The thicknesses um, of the loads vary from 2 to 50 meters plus, and there's this pinching and swelling along strike. We don't have a lot of control down dip because most of the exploration uh, to date has been trenching um, with some drilling, but not a lot of drilling. So we don't really know what's been happening at depth, but I assume that you'll have very similar pinching and swelling going down depth as well, doing down dip. Uh, and the flake size and grade tends to increase with the uh, quartz feldspar, uh, feldspar pegmatites. And in some cases, you get these large jumbo graphic flakes and they're oriented perpendicular to the wall of the thin pegmatites and veins. Uh, just some examples uh, from core. And you also get some, some um, vein as well, vein graphite. Uh, just to give you a quick overview of the, um, of, the of the structural foliation, as you can see, these blue disks are foliation, the red are shear zones, 
the yellow is drill holes, and the yellow color is roughly um, the graphite outcrop on surface. So again, it's, you, get, you get a slight, it's not very clear here because of the orientation of this leapfrog view, but there is a slight swing as you go further north. And there's also another deposit down to the south where it's more obvious. So I'm running out of time here. So, um, so just, to, just to say, that these loads, again, there's, another, there's a fault structure here which is rotating these northern loads slightly more clockwise than the southern loads. Uh, and the variography and the geostatistics are slightly different on either side of that fault structure. Uh, each of these loads have been modelled individually um, based on flake size uh, and, and also grade. I also um, d uh, divided them into a fresh zone and a, and a weathered zone for modeling purposes. Um, when, it come, when it comes to reporting great tonnage, you obviously are using your oxide in transition, but uh, because of the most of the sampling being on surface, I decided to combine the, um, the oxide in transition in, into a weathered zone. So again, you can see each of, the, each of these loads is individually um, been modeled. There's, there's also a possible fold axis coming in through here as well giving you this little fold off um, here and here. Okay, I'm just going to skip this. This is just the variograms um, showing off north and south that you've got, sl you've got slight different, different directions of greatest uh, continuity of your mineralization, which you need to take account of when you're doing your um, estimation. So just a very quick summary. Um, we have regional polyphase deformation of near Proterozoic basement on an existing structural template. Um, the fault offsets the loads, and there's also a regional rotation event. And the rotation affects the variography, so yeah, that needs to be um, taken into account when, when doing estimation. And you have these large jumble flakes associated with faulting and pegmatitic intrusion. So just some concluding thoughts, just uh, take away. Um, three selected projects, just illustrating the three main different forms of natural graphite, amorphous, um, flake, and uh, vein. They're all hosted, uh, with exception probably of um, uh, Kalimantan, which is Permian, but most of them are hosted by high-grade metamorphic rocks. And uh, to me, I think the most important thing is understanding the structure um, before you, you actually get to do, before you actually start doing any resource estimation or domain modeling, you really need to understand structure first. Um, inadequate structure, in my opinion, means an inadequate resource. Okay, thank you. <laughs>